This is Terry Hawkins. I'm very privileged to be speaking to one of the great basso voices of our time, Jerome Hines, who recently celebrated his 41st consecutive season at the Metropolitan Opera, and who this weekend will be singing the role of Boris Godunov with the Oakland Opera. Of all the roles that you've sung during your career, you're probably best known for your terrifying portrayals of the tyrant Tsar Boris. Could you talk a little about how you've come to understand the character, what insights you try to bring out in your interpretation? Well, I did a fair amount of study um, in various ways. The first thing I did when I approached the role, uh, I saw the confusion in opinions among stage directors as to what was wrong with Boris. He's supposed to be a madman or going insane. And, um, you know, the common garden variety uh, opinion of what insanity is, is sort of rolling, staring eyes and all kinds of crazy gestures and stuff, which make no particular sense. And so I thought I would go to the experts. I was out, before I did the Boris, uh, I was out on an eight-week concert tour, and I managed to interview about eight psychiatrists and psychologists in different cities. Uh, different universities and things like this. And um, I would read to them the essential plot of Boris Goodenough and then ask him what was wrong with the man. And to my amazement, it didn't, it didn't help my faith in psychiatry one bit to find that out of eight opinions, I got <laughs> eight completely different <clears throat> opinions. No two of them agreed on practically anything. And so it kind of left it up for grabs as to how I was going to decided to do it. And um, I managed, with some effort, to write a, an article in which I coalesced these views down into sort of three broad divergent pictures. Uh, and I called the article The Three Faces of Boris, and it was published by Musical America back in 1954. And um, one view, there was nothing wrong with the man at all. He was just a, an example of his society, that people in those days believed in ghosts, and they believed in retribution for their sins, and if he'd see a flicker of light in the corner, like any sane, rational man, he'd say, that's the ghost that's after me, and he wasn't crazy at all. Uh, the second view was that of the uh, schizophrenic, uh, and uh, it would serve well in the great mad scene and the hallucinations and things of the sort. But at the same time, it would make him a man that is, should we say, captive in a box of glass. He's in his own little world. He can't feel emotion for anybody else but himself. And it's kind of difficult then with this very warm emotional death scene when he's saying farewell to his son whom he so dearly loves. It's kind of hard to play it as a cold schizophrenic who was only feeling for the boy is as an extension of himself. And then the third one was the manic depressive type, which has these great swings of emotion from, from a, a tremendous high to a tremendous lows. And then there's the father figure, Shuiski, whom he detests, he mistrusts, and yet he depends totally upon him. So he will grab him by the throat, say, now, I'm going to have you drawn and quartered, I'm going to have you roasted on the spit, I'm going to this and that. Now, what do we do? You know, he's just, <clears throat> and um, that final view is the one that I have basically adopted. I think it's the one that fits the whole picture. I also studied the role by reading all of the collected letters and writings of Mussorgsky. And um, I soon discovered that he had uh, modified the Pushkin play a bit, in Pushkin, Boris dies of a, uh, he has a hemorrhaging from the, the mouth, the nose, and the ears. Now, of course, any medical doctor will say, well, wait a minute, only a basal skull fracture would do that from the ears. Uh, he would, probably Pushkin was trying to do a very highly uh, emotional picture of what he was imagining to be a cerebral hemorrhage. And he could live long enough after the cerebral hemorrhage to carry out a, a, a conversation of goodbye with his son. In fact, the first couple of times I did the role, I played it that way with a horse capsule and everything, uh, blood all over my face and so on. Uh, however, um, the general picture really, though, in the, um, in the libretto of Boris itself is that he's 
having a heart attack with the sensation that he can't breathe, he's getting dizzy, and uh, when you read the letters of Mussorgsky, he had symptoms of a dizziness and a shortness of breath and so forth, which all the doctors agreed on one thing, that he was just, these are hysterical symptoms, he was not having a heart attack at all. Although he would always write, as you know, I, like other musicians and artistic people, have a weak heart. Well, it could have been too weak. He died in his 40s of acute alcoholism and uh, cirrhosis of the liver. He must have had a pretty strong heart to, have substan uh, to live through that. But he was taking his symptoms and putting them into Boris. He was beginning to be Boris himself. And this is further substantiated by rumors. Uh, I had heard the rumors, and I followed them up in the Soviet Union when I was over there, and they, it was a common uh, idea around that when Mussorgsky was a young man, he had been uh, uh, indicted and was tried on a manslaughter charge. He was exonerated and allowed to go free, but it seems very probable that he had accidentally killed someone. And you can imagine how that would affect his life. It might account for his terrible drinking problem. And uh, uh, in his program notes, when the opera was first done in the Paris Opera, he said, I completely identify myself with Boris Gudunov. And here's a czar that had a child killed out of the exigency of gaining the throne, then regretted it and spends the whole opera praying to God to please forgive him this terrible thing. And so I think it accounts for, if there really was a manslaughter case here, it accounts for the fact that Boris, in some respects, especially when, uh, surrounding Boris himself, I cannot think of any opera which has more uh, real human emotion in it. He just poured out his whole soul into, into that character of Boris Goodenough. And so um, these were the insights that I got. I managed to work with many, many stage directors, a couple of them really geniuses, uh, on the role, got many different views. I managed to, when I was in the Soviet Union on my first tour, I got nothing because they kept saying, no, no, we want to see how you do it in America. So they wouldn't show me anything. So the second time I went by, I said, now you've seen what I do. Please give me some insight on what you do and how you play it. Uh, I didn't come off liking too much what they did with it over there, strangely enough, and it's their home base. Uh, they would say, well, you're too emotional. Uh, Azar, uh, Azar doesn't cry. Uh, you should be played like Shakespeare. And their idea of Shakespeare is something that is classical but not real. And it's not the best way to play Shakespeare either. And, um, in fact, when the Bolshoi came to New York... Um, the young man, the, or the man playing the part of Boris, was very hard hit. He was not successful with the American audiences at all because he was so cold. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back right after that and did it at the Met, uh, I got one of my greatest reviews of my life from the New York Times because they were contrasting my emotional Boris to the Bolshoi's ice-cold one. And um, I think our view is, is better. Okay. Well, that was the classic confrontation when Van Cliburn won the uh, piano award in, in Russia. They said that the, the Russians were so cold and, and he was so warm that they, no. they liked him so much, so well, much that better. Ma that makes sense, because the Russian people themselves are a very warm-blooded people. They're very emotional and uh, very lovable, really. So um, I knew Van quite well before he went to the Soviet Union, and... Uh, uh, I haven't seen him much in recent years, but we were pretty good friends at that time. And uh, it was a funny parallel. He got famous, of course, by that picture of Khrushchev giving him a kiss on the cheek after he won the contest. And um, uh, then here was I on my return engagement in my first tour of the Soviet Union doing the Boris when Kennedy de declared a blockade of Cuba. And... Uh, for a political move, Khrushchev came to the performance and gave me a big reception with my wife and uh, used us to inform the West that he wasn't going to fight over Cuba. When we got back to New York the next night, all the press of the world was waiting for us, everybody holding their breath, saying, only you and Mrs. Hines are the only people in the West that have spoken to Khrushchev about this. 
are we going to fight World War III tomorrow morning when we stop the first Russian ship? And we were able to come back with a message and say, no, the last thing was a message. A toast to peace and friendship between our countries. There's not going to be a war. Boris Kuznetsov is a truly political offer then. Oh, well, it certainly was in that case, I'll tell you. With Boris Godunov, there's always the question of which version of the opera to use. Uh, Mussorgsky's original orchestration was greatly revised by Rimsky-Korsakov for the version that's most frequently performed, and you well, will be you using... Know, it's, it's even more complex than you just said. Mussorgsky wrote two versions, and uh, Korsakov rewrote the second one. Uh, the first one was a dismal flop. There were no women in the cast. There was no Polish scenes. Uh, by putting the Polish scenes in, it almost made it into two operas because the two casts never meet. I've actually done productions in the Soviet Union where I never even met the people from the, the Polish scenes, wouldn't know what they even looked like. Uh, but it gave the opera a more complete, rounded-out form. It was more successful, plus the fact that the big mad scene, uh, uh, the clock scene with Boris, that scene is like another opera. When Musoshi rewrote it, he really rewrote it. The uh, coronation and the death scene are just about the same, but he redid it, and the second one is so far superior to the original, it's just not to be believed. Uh, so then Korsakov redid the second one. In some ways, he made it harder to sing. It's a higher part. And then uh, there were constant uh, attempts to better on, you know, to do, do better than Korsakov. Uh, Shostakovich not only did the second Mussorgsky, he did the first one as well. He did both of them. And then there was the Lom version, which they used to say that the Mussorgsky was unplayable, so the Lom took it and made it more playable. Then at the Met, we did it back in 1951 or two, uh, the Rothaus version, which was another one. And so there comes up with be about seven versions of Boris, of which I have done every one of them, and in three different languages. It got pretty hairy sometimes. I was in Siberia doing the, the uh, Shostakovich of the original Mussorgsky. A week later, I was in uh, Columbus, Ohio, at the university, doing a concert version of the Korsakov in English. And the next week, I was in Buenos Aires doing the Korsakov in Italian. And boy, I tell you, I was having a lot of trouble slipping in between the cracks there. It was going from version to version. I'm sure the versions aren't that totally different, so it would be easy well, to uh, right. mistake one enough, for the other. You know, uh, the original Mussorgsky, of course, the second act, is so completely different, of course, there's just no confusion. But when you go from the, um, the second Mussorgsky or the Shostakovich version of it to the Korsakov, uh, there are some really major changes, but there's a lot of little subtle changes where a bar will change from 3 to 4 to 4 or something, and those are the ones that drive you crazy. I've heard that the original Mussorgsky orchestration is much more austere and much more, yes. some people say, more haunting than the, the brilliant colors of the Rimsky-Korsakov. Have you found that to be mm. true? My feeling is this. The, the orchestration is a little clumsier. It's, uh, it is austere. It's bare. And it's louder somehow. Uh, in the delicate moments, you cannot feel like you can really do the beautiful, gentle pianissimo tones in the death scene. You've got to still sing pretty loud to get over the sound. But the Korsakov, with its refinement, allows you more refinement that way. Now, the best way to plead the cause of the Korsakov is to go to the Soviet Union, where, of course, this is their greatest opera. They make the most of it. And at the Bolshoi, which is their great center of all opera, they only do the Korsakov. Then Leningrad, in order to be different from Moscow, which is the constant battle, then they don't do the, the second Shostakovich, the, the original Shostakovich, the first one, which is really an inferior work. And, but they just do it to be different. And also Novosibirsk and Siberia uh, does it. But everybody else does the Korsakov. You did a recording of Lohengrin with Eric Leinsdorf where you sang the role of King Henry. Would you tell us something about doing that? You know, regretfully I have to say that that recording sort of ended my, my um, performing days with Eric Leinsdorf. And I, I'm sorry for it because I think he's a marvelous conductor, a really of the grand old style. I mean, he, he's one of the uh, uh, endangered species now. And... Uh, 
But it was one of those occasions where everything was crammed together. We had, I think it was one or two, it was two performances of Lohengrin, and then three days of recording, and they were all on consecutive days. And then he demanded that we sing rehearsals full voice. I said, Eric, there's no way, so it'll be a good warm-up for you. Of course, conductors really don't know what the singing voice is all about, including the great Eric Leinsdorf. And I saw a disaster coming. And when we got to the final day, Rita Gore, as I remember, refused to come to the session. She locked herself in her hotel room. Uh, Konya, once or twice, I have to hate to say, but he cracked. Uh, we were all dead tired. My voice was a, a disaster by then. Eric suddenly calls up and says, Shall we repeat this thing? I said, You buy me a new pair of vocal cords? When can we go home? You know, and he got mad. I never worked. Because that man is a wonderful conductor. And I remember he, in the style of, of Toscanini, in the style of Bruno Walter and Kleva and all these people, he worked with you for weeks, molding every word into you. And he, you learned. It was a great learning experience. And in my mind, this was one of the great conductors of, the, of this time. And uh, so that fateful Lohengrin, uh, I don't have happy memories about it. One final question. Of the many roles that you've sung over the years, which role do you have the most fondness for? Would it, would it be Boris? Yes, and I'll tell you something. There's a way of wording it that you can trap the singer. You know, a lot of singers will try to dodge that issue. They'll always say, oh, my favorite role is the next one I sing. That's a lot of hokum. So one lady, one night after a concert, she trapped me. She didn't say, what's your favorite opera? She said, if you could only sing one opera for the rest of your life, which one would you pick? <laughs> and that got me, and then I was forced to say, I guess it would be Boris Goodenough. Probably the second one maybe would be Faust, which is this, the opera I've done the most. Boris I've done second most. And there's other roles I love very much, but I think I would pick the Boris. I've been talking with Jerome Hines, who this weekend will be singing the role of Boris Gudunov with the Oakland Opera. Thank you very much for doing this interview. You're certainly welcome. My pleasure.